All right, um, welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. This is the top of the hour. Um, as I assume most of you all know, this is the official launch webinar for the MetaDream Automation, or sorry, Meta Automation Dream Challenge. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, the goal of this presentation is to give everyone sort of an overview of what the challenge is all about, as well as some uh, basic instructions for how to get started and um, how to start participating in the challenge. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, um, as we're going through, if you have questions, you can use the Q&A uh, button to start populating questions there uh, instead of the chat, and then we'll keep track of those as we go and address them at the end. Um, all right, so jumping into things. Um, just wanted to quickly call out uh, all the people that have contributed to this challenge, um, and there's probably more that we haven't listed on this page, but um, it's been a combined effort from uh, some of the uh, experts at NCI and um, organizers related to the Cancer Moonshot program, uh, as well as those of us at Sage Bio Networks uh, to design the challenge and to uh, get the data prepared and to get everything ready for uh, you guys to do your work. Um, so just a, a quick overview of what we'll be covering today. Uh, Eric from NCI is going to give some background on the Cancer Moonshot Initiative as well as some of the motivation for this challenge. Uh, Tomas is going to uh, then take over and give some introduction to what dream challenges are all about, uh, as well as talk a little bit about the model to data paradigm that we'll be using for this particular challenge. Um, and then I'll, I'll go through some more of the details um, for the challenge and how to participate. All right, so Eric, take it away. Welcome everyone. So one goal, just like it says on the slide, is for the Cancer Moonshine is to create a national cancer data ecosystem to collect, share, and a broad array of large data, data sets. Really trying to leverage this so that researchers, clinicians, patients will be able to contribute, analyze data, facilitating discovery that will ultimately improve patient care and outcomes. So part of this endeavor is really the vision of the Cancer Reacher Data Commons. Many of you might be aware, for those of you who don't, uh, we aim to collect data across diverse groups of cancer researchers, each collecting biomedical data in different formats. This means data must be retrospectively harmonized, transformed to enable this data to be submitted, in addition to be findable by the broader scientific community. Um, so really trying to get high quality consistent metadata in a very automated fashion to really reduce the burden uh, for data submitters and also to help with aggregating data. Um, and so that's kind of that in a really quick uh, synopsis. Next slide. So, and really to, to do this in our vision, just as like I mentioned, is to really reduce this manual burden. That includes data sharing, data discovery, really improving data integration, harmonization, data mapping. Right, next slide. All right. So, some examples of data integration challenges, right? We have non standard term shortening, abbreviations. Um, everybody has their own way of coding things, so really finding a way to overcome these issues and to integrate things. Uh, we have ambiguity, um, data survival, since when, what's the time point, how do you infer that? Uh, we have data encoding, terms versus codes. We have Boolean field representation, binary, yes, no, true, false. Uh, and then really looking at granularity. We have numeric ranges versus absolute values, how to address these issues, unit differences, days versus months, and of course, missing fields. How can we uh, infer the data that's missing? Eric, uh, I accidentally skipped a slide, but I think that helped with uh, some of the motivation, so. Yes. <laughs> All right, and then, so why this challenge? So just what we talked about just a minute ago, uh, really wanting the need, we have a lot of large initiatives coming online. Uh, we have a lot of single cell initiatives. We have a lot of initiatives that are data heavy. Um, and we really want to be able to address this challenge for data submitters, uh, for aggregating data that's spread across many different common nodes, many different data arrays. And so we really need this high quality uh, uh, metadata to do this. And so really improving data reuse, integration, to lead to new discoveries, to better support for precision medicine, uh, for the Cancer Moonshot initiatives, um, and really uh, trying to figure out ways of perspective data harmonization and the lack of meditation thereof. Um, and some of the, it's a really huge manual effort, as many of you are well aware, um, and it spans across not only the cancer research continuum, but across a lot of 
uh, research and intensive data heavy uh, field. And so we're hoping to have a broad participation uh, in this challenge to really see uh, the survey of approaches that you guys come up with. And so we're really looking forward to that. And so how to achieve this vision, all right? How do we go from here to there? Well, you're not going to have, you're not going to be able to account for all the pitfalls, but we need to find a, a good way of going forward. And this is the approach with this challenge, uh, this pilot metadata automation challenge. And so really, we're really asking you guys to leverage existing resources, um, but you can also go above and beyond. But the examples we have here that we're going to provide is the NCI thesaurus um, and also NCI, uh, the cancer data, uh, uh, CADSR. Um, and so really looking at these as ways to um, find your common data elements and to use this to annotate the data. Um, and so we'll explain that more in a minute as we go through this uh, webinar. And so I think with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Thomas and James from SAGE. Okay, now I'm unmuted mid and I show my sound. Um, should I stop sharing? Uh, no, it's good. You can just go on the next slide. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Dream has a long history of um, of uh, developing challenges, scientific challenges that target biomedical problems. Um, Dream challenges are organized in tight collaboration with uh, with Sage Bio Network using the our platform Synapse. So, the goal of Dream challenges is also to foster the collaboration between different groups. Um, in order to promote collaboration, um, also to democratize access and use of biomedical data. Uh, at the end of a challenge, whenever it's possible, we, we would, as uh, the organizer, try to release all the data set that have been used during the, the challenge to really um, make the challenge live uh, even beyond um, the timeline of a traditional challenge, whenever it's possible. And also, we are also attempting to accelerate research, so by promoting good, um, best practices for the development of model and solution to make the model follow some standard typically in the dream challenge all the models submitted accept like the same input the same output so that helps future researchers also to um, continue using developing upon this model assembling this model uh, and so on and we also provide an objective and unbiased framework for the evaluation and dissemination of biomedical algorithms by um, applying rules to make sure that in order to prevent, for instance, overfitting uh, on the data. So that's always something we, we really care about. Next slide. So we have organized so far um, more than 50 challenges uh, uh, acro across different biomedical disciplines, um, starting from 2006. So the, the type of scientific questions that we ask in dream challenges are um, cover uh, uh, a broad um, many domains uh, from diagnostic, prognostic, or predictive AI, and also targeting data such as genomics or problem in system biology, imaging. Um, to give you an example, the digital mammography dream challenge, which we conducted uh, a few years ago. And right now we have also a, a near chart dream challenges um, going on. Next slide. Um, if you could go to the next, and then we will go back to this okay. one. I just change it. Um, so here you can see the workflow of a traditional dream challenge. And, and I would say until like a few years ago. So that was how it was doing. So typically training data would be available to the participant uh, with, a, with a label, the gold standard, as well as validation data. So participating team are able to download the training data build their model on their own local computer or server. And then they would take as input the validation data. They would generate uh, a prediction file and then send this prediction file to the organizer of the challenge. And then the organizer are the only one who have like the ground truth of this corresponding to this prediction. And then the organizer would score the, the prediction file and then rank the, the participating team. So that's how we were doing it. Um, still a few years ago, and we still have a few challenges that follow this format. But uh, in some cases, and if you go back to the slide before, um, in some cases, it's not possible to release the data. As I mentioned previously, we have, for instance, an EHR uh, data, or in, in the case of if you have like mammogram uh, data set for breast cancer, that's not data that, that are 
allowed to be shared. So the, the system that um, we really helped to democratize, starting like at least three, four years ago, is a paradigm called model to data paradigm. Next slide. So in using this, this approach, so participants do not have access to the, to the training data, or at least, oh no, in that case, so here it's in the case where only validation is basically uh, in the cloud. So in this case, and, and that's targeting actually this challenge, you will get access to some training data that we have been allowed to, to share with you. And then using this data, you will be able to build your model. But then we are asking you to, to dockerize your model. So it means like putting it in a box, um, in a virtual machine that can then be run easily on any computer uh, without having to worry about the version of the library that you use, uh, et cetera. And so your submission is no longer a prediction file, but it's this dockerized model or containerized model, which you will then submit. And then us in the, in the cloud, we will be able to, to run your program, which lives in, inside this, uh, this container. And then we will feed it with uh, the validation data, which we are not allowed to share. And then we will score the, the prediction generated, and then we will return the, the leaderboard. Next slide. So this model um, can be applied to many domains, so typically or different environments. So one of them is typically academic research. And here on the right side, you have a, a few existing dream past or current dream challenges. So we have a, we had a multi multiple myeloma prognosis challenge, proteogenomic, fusion detection, tumor deconvolution. So that's all problem that we have or are currently addressing in dream challenges. In case of clinical trial too, when the data cannot be shared with the participant. So that's uh, a challenge which we are going to, to launch uh, pretty soon. So the checkpoint inhibitor response challenge. And also in healthcare, um, as I mentioned previously, we organize a digital mammography challenge. Right now we have the EHR mortality prediction, which uh, we will enter soon in its uh, final phase. And um, also another challenge, clinical NLP. Next slide. So in this challenge, the question that we are asking you is given a file that contains uh, colon headers and data set value, as you can see on, on the left. So it, it's really like a, a table. Annotate these headers and this data value um, with the best existing metadata along with a confidence rank. And that all used using standard uh, metadata from, from a database. And so your submission is a Docker container that takes as input a table, so with header and column and data values, and the output will be your annotation, your predicted annotation. Next slide. Me now. Mm -hmm. So I muted myself. All right. Um, so getting into the heart of things, um, first I just wanted to remind everyone. Hopefully you've already been to the, the challenge site on Synapse, um, but this is really kind of the go-to source for all of the relevant information about the challenge, including um, instructions to register, uh, documentation for the data, as well as participation instructions, um, access for the data files and tables, um, some other background info and references to check out. Um, the discussion forums are a, a great place to ask questions and. Um, all of us uh, on the organizing team will be monitoring those threads uh, and trying to provide timely replies. Um, and then, of course, the leaderboards will be um, where you can see the results of the different tools and uh, submissions. Um, and it's worth noting that we will make um, the slides and recording of this webinar available on the website as well. Um, just a reminder about the timeline. Um, so we, we started the, what we're calling open phase uh, on January 14th, which was effectively opening up the site and uh, providing access for people to start exploring and uh, understanding the problem. Um, today, of course, the webinar. And then on uh, February 10th, we will start round one of the leaderboard phase. This is where we'll start um, accepting uh, submissions, um, evaluating tools, and providing results on the scoreboard. Uh, this will continue until um, March 10th, where we'll kind of shift into round two. Uh, there's not likely to be anything too structurally different uh, between the rounds, just 
uh, to keep things a little more uh, sane. Um, and then the, the leaderboard phase will end um, April 9th, which will uh, transition into the validation phase. Uh, during this phase, participants will submit their, their final model um, and that um, performance of that model will be what um, is considered for the overall ranking of, um, and awarding of prizes. All right, so um, in terms of what it means to participate in this challenge, um, as Tomas mentioned, um, the goal is really to take um, representative um, and synthetic and real data files that have been um, either publicly made available previously or um, have been hidden for uh, or not yet published. Um, and basically uh, your goal, oops, sorry, <laughs> is to annotate the meaning of the columns and rows using standard metadata. Um, and when I say you, uh, again, this is um, ultimately about developing algorithms and tools uh, that can be run uh, in a semi-automated way. So it's really about your tool being able to provide these annotations uh, without uh, human supervision. Um, when we talk about metadata annotation, again, what we're really referring to is uh, structured information that specifies the meaning of data fields and data values. So these metadata are drawn from existing resources, um, in particular, the CADSR metadata repository and the NCI terminology. Um, and these resources include everything from labels and question texts, uh, definitions to data types and lists of permitted values. Um, it's worth noting that it's uh, completely reasonable and even expected that participants will uh, go outside of these resources if they um, find other valuable sources to develop and train their, their models. But we are requiring that the final outputs be um, pulled from these particular databases. Um, so just a quick note on uh, the CADSR. This is kind of the primary source for the common data elements metadata that we'll be um, requiring and evaluating for this challenge. Um, you can find a lot of the different examples of uh, fields and attributes and um, identifiers that we're sharing through the Synapse site um, and in kind of more uh, flat tables through the Common Data Element browser, uh, which is a really rich uh, website for um, searching and exploring different uh, terms based on standards that have been collected over time. Um, of course, this includes both the enumerated and non-enumerated data elements, um, as well as the, the value domain details and specifications uh, for the different uh, data elements. Um, just worth noting, the CADSR is based on uh, the ISO IEC 11179 metadata registry standard. And so if you're feeling really ambitious and want to learn more uh, about a lot of the background, uh, you're welcome to dive into that documentation. Um, in terms of the challenge data that you'll be working with, um, we have a, a variety of different files um, that are both uh, available in annotated as well as unannotated versions. Um, these include what we labeled as synthetic, real, and scrambled, uh, and they're again all representative of clinical data for uh, developing your tools. Um, the largest source of data uh, that you have available now is uh, from the CADSR. These are uh, tables that have been generated or synthesized from the CADSR database. Uh, so we've produced uh, 60 files in total. Um, one set of files that um, is available with 100 columns each and another set that has 200 columns each. Uh, the files are effectively the same except the larger files um, have additional columns uh, in case you want to use those to, to develop uh, solutions. Um, again, this, this pulls from real um, examples from the 50,000 plus common data elements that have been used in cancer and biomedical research and clinical trials and registered in the CDSR over the past 20 years, um, but with you know, a small amount of mangling and munging and uh, shuffling to make it a little bit more realistic of what you might expect with um, 
user submitted data. Um, then we have three brain cancer data study files from the Cancer Imaging Archive. Um, these are real and publicly available data sets. Um, what's not been previously published is the uh, manual annotations that we've provided to correspond to these data files. Um, and so we'll make a subset of those uh, manual annotations available for you to develop your tools. Um, and then finally, we have um, two uh, sets of data files that have been um, kind of scrambled and masked and de-identified from the Apollo Moonshot project. Um, and we also have manual annotation available for these that you can use to develop your tool. Um, so I wanted to step through a little bit of an example of kind of what it looks like uh, to go through the process of, of taking um, input data, in this case, um, a real or somewhat messy table that might have been uh, published in uh, some journal or submitted to a, a data commons or a data repository, um, and what it looks like to go through the process of annotating the columns and values in that table. Um, so in the, the context of this challenge, uh, and what it means to provide an annotation. Um, there's a number of different uh, properties and values that we are uh, asking the tools to aggregate and um, assign to each column and value. So this is all um, pretty thoroughly documented on the challenge site, but again, uh, a note that um, this is all coming uh, ultimately from the, the CADSR uh, resource, um, and whether you access those pieces of information directly from CADSR or through um, the exported version of the CADSR database, that's kind of up to you and how you want your tool to perform. Um, so kind of the first step is, is um, providing details about the uh, data element that maps to the field name or the column header. Um, so in this case, you can see that gender is the original value that was found in the table um, and the best match according to the curators um, is person gender text type so um, what we're asking for that is information about the data element as well as the data element concepts um, and the concept codes that are coming from ncit or the nci thesaurus um, once you've identified or selected your best guess for the data element then the next step is to go through the observed values. Uh, note that this is just the unique set of observed values. You don't have to provide annotations for every single row, um, but then um, you follow up by annotating the observed values with the matching permissible value according to the value domain of the data element. Um, so you can spend some more time with this slide and uh, kind of let it soak it all in. Um, but we're expecting that you know there could be a little bit of a learning curve uh, figuring out what what information to provide and a reminder that we're available to answer any questions you all have either today or through the website um, i wanted to clarify that uh, again not all data it will be these uh, enumerated cases where you have you know a finite set of possible values of different strings and categories but also uh, non-enumerated categories. So this is an example of uh, survival time and months uh, where the, the matched data element um, is, according to the CADSR, a non-enumerated value domain. Um, so in this case, what we're asking participants to do is to look at the different specifications of the value, uh, of the value in terms of length, um, decimal place, things like that and say whether or not it is conforming or non-conforming. Um, you'll encounter some cases where you are um, able to identify a match or a, a most likely match for the, the header uh, in terms of the data element itself. But when you look through the individual row values, you might encounter something that does not fall within the permissible value or the um, Specification for the specification for the value domain of that data element. Uh, so in this case, for um, this uh, patient disease name, you can provide matched permissible values for astrocytoma and glioblastoma, 
But for this oligodendroglioma, you would provide a, a no match response. Um, similarly, if uh, you have um, a data element where you've determined that the, the field should be um, not enumerated and you either observe values that don't meet the specifications of um, you know, maximum, minimum values, decimal place, other types of uh, format information, um, or uh, as you might notice in this case, the, the column um, is it's not really uh, numbers at all um, or more ranges, you would label that as non-conforming. Um, and I wanted to, to call out a, a, a couple nuances that um, are good to look out for. Um, this particular example can be extended to the next slide where you see that um, depending on your designation or prediction of whether a column is enumerated or non-enumerated, um, and this is the exact same set of values as the last slide, uh, that will ultimately influence how you annotate those, those values as well. So um, in this case, um, the, the match data element has been deemed to be a category, um, and that category has a set of permissible values associated with it, yet these, these um, data entries still don't fall within that permissible value domain, and thus would be labeled no matches. Um, another point uh, to call out is that in um, the real uh, and scrambled data sets that we'll be providing from TCIA and from Apollo, uh, there are a number of fields that have uh, some, or in some cases, even all missing values or, or null fields. Um, so that's something that um, could potentially trip up your tool, your algorithm, and you will need to account for. Um, and then uh, at, as should come as no surprise, there are also some fields that are uh, pretty highly irregular, even um, from row to row within the column. Um, so again, just a, a, a note about some of the resources that are available to you as participants. Um, we've made a, an export of the CDSR database available as a table uh, with documentation of the different um, columns and uh, some examples of the entries that you can find in that table. Uh, you can download this as a, as a TSV, um, or tab separated file, um, from the Synapse site. And you can also explore it under the, the tables tab uh, if you want to just kind of poke around and, and get a sense for um, what information is in this resource. Um, similarly, we've also provided an export of the NCI Thesaurus database. Um, and this is more detailed information on um, the, the coding and, and definition of um, specific concepts and terminologies. Um, you can take a look at the challenge website for a kind of more extended example, but um, this is something that Denise, one of our organizers and uh, an experienced data curator herself put together, um, how someone uh, in a more manual approach might step through the annotation process, um, you know, starting with the CDE browser and searching for different um, forms of the field name and uh, messing with the settings, um, using a, a terminology system like NCIT to look for synonyms or preferred terms, um, searching for some of the, um, searching using the actual data values or row values to see if you can pull in any additional matches that way. Uh, consider some of the various quality factors or statuses that are uh, indicated by CADSR. Um, look at how much the different data elements have been used in existing and registered data sets. Um, and then finally, when all else fails, you can try to Google for it. Um, so this could be worth uh, checking out for people that want to get, get a sense for um, how to start tackling this problem. Um, we talked a little bit about um, you know, which data is available for participants to use and which data will be uh, kind of restricted and held back um, that participants won't get to see. Uh, this is just kind of a summary of that again. Um, so for the CADSR data, um, the tables that have been synthesized um, as well as the corresponding annotations um, are all available through Synapse um, and can be downloaded uh, through the site. 
for the manually curated data sets, again, we have these three real data sets and one scrambled data set from Apollo. Um, we're currently in the process of randomly splitting these into uh, subsets of columns. Uh, we'll provide the bulk of the columns as well as the corresponding annotations for those columns uh, to participants to um, inspect and use to develop their tool. Um, and then the remaining set of columns will hold out um, and keep only available within the scoring environment so we can uh, use those to evaluate submitted tools um, according to data that they haven't seen yet. Um, and then finally, the, um, the validation data set is also one of these uh, scrambled data sources um, that will never be made available to participants. And so it's, it's up to the, the models that they developed through the leaderboard phase to be able to handle this new input and hopefully provide a correct output. Um, just a quick note on scoring, I won't get into too much detail here, um, but the evaluation of submissions will be um, driven by comparing the user submitted results to the um, manually curated results uh, or that we're treating as the gold standard. Um, so kind of in order of, of operations, um, kind of the, the first step to check is whether or not the result um, matches the gold standard. Um, and of course, if that result is the top ranked result that has been submitted, uh, that gets uh, the maximum amount of points uh, with a little bonus. Um, following kind of the different paths through this flowchart, um, if the match uh, is found, but it's not your best match, then we also check whether you have good um, overlap between the data element concept codes and those that have been identified by in the gold standard. Um, and then finally, um, if that check doesn't pass as well, we'll um, dig into the, the value domain annotations uh, and see how the designation of permissible values and conforming or non-forming uh, align with what is found in the gold standard. Um, it's worth noting that while this um, uh, process is a little uh, convoluted, we will also provide um, all of the source code that we're using to uh, calculate the scores, um, not only for you to use to uh, iteratively test your models locally, but also so you can have full transparency into how the scoring is working. All right, so um, just a quick note on incentives. Uh, there will be prize cash awards for top performers. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail uh, soon. Um, there will be, of course, the opportunity to evaluate uh, the top solutions um, and hopefully produce something um, of value to the community, because I think all of us understand the, the frustrations and, and difficulties in this field. Um, of course, bragging rights for top performers. Um, and uh, the, the plan for this challenge, as with all challenges, is to summarize the, the results and the findings um, in a, a follow-up overall manuscript. And so, of course, those who participate will be eligible for authorship on that manuscript. Um, this has kind of been covered a little bit uh, in different pieces, but um, just showing the breakdown of kind of what the overall workflow will look like. Again, during the open phase, uh, there's not much for you to do except for uh, see what's there, um, start playing around with the data, start playing around with approaches, um, and get oriented to be able to start submitting tools in the leaderboard phase. Um, during the leaderboard phase, that's where you'll start to um, take your, your tool that you've developed um, and the uh, containerized or dockerized version of that tool and submit it to Synapse, where in the scoring environment, we'll start to compare it to the held out annotated um, uh, manually curated data. And from there, uh, start posting results of the scoring onto the leaderboard. So uh, you'll have multiple submissions uh, and you can iterate and try and improve your score and also see, of course, where you stack up uh, compared to other participants. Um, this will uh, continue for, I think, about two months. Um, and then at the conclusion of the leaderboard phase, 
you'll hopefully have come up with your, your best solution and your final tool will be submitted, compared against the uh, held out validation data and used to determine your, your final ranking. Um, I wanted to note that, um, again, this is maybe a, a fairly uh, foreign or complex challenge space for uh, a number of participants. I know that it was for me and it's taken a fair amount of time to get uh, up to speed on, on how to approach it. Um, so we, we have put together um, and we are putting together uh, a, what we're referring to as a baseline tool. Um, we'll share a, a fully worked example of um, kind of how this tool was put together and how the approach works. And um, of course, uh, step through some uh, real cases of, of how it works on uh, the challenge input data. Uh, we'll share the, the code for this, um, a demonstration notebook and a Docker image. And hopefully this can be a, a useful resource for people uh, to get started with and um, a point where they can iterate and improve, but also figure out um, kind of the, the nitty gritty about how to participate. Um, and now I'll, I'll hand it back over to Tomas um, so we can give a little bit more of an overview of kind of what it will mean to Dockerize your tools and submit those Dockerized tools to the challenge. Okay, I'm using my output sound. Thank you, James. Um, so I just want to remind you that you have the uh, opportunity to ask questions uh, in Zoom. So if you do so, then we will uh, be able to answer them during this uh, webinar. Otherwise, as I will show you later, we have a discussion forum, which will be the, the typical place where you can ask uh, questions and interact with other participants as well as organizers. So this slide is just to um, give some notion about Docker and also its terminology. Um, as I mentioned, Docker has been used successfully in, in many challenges, starting, I would say, something like four years ago. So as you can see in the illustration, so it all starts with a Docker file. And if we are familiar, for instance, with C++, where you have a make file, so this is uh, similar. So you, you will create a Docker file which contain all the instruction on how to package your program uh, into a Docker image. And so in this Docker file, you will specify, for instance, which operating system you're going to use, and, and for instance, Unix distribution, whether you use Debian or CentOS. You are then able to install um, dependencies and packages, and, and then also add to this Docker image your own program. Um, for instance, also Python script or C++ binary. So once you build this Docker file, so you end up with a Docker image, which is basically a file which you can have on your local computer, but which you can also store in Docker registry. And Synapse, which is a platform you're going to use to, to make submission for this challenge, provide uh, a Docker registry as a, as, a, as a service. So you have the Docker image, and then when you start running it using the command docker run and then a few options and the name of your docker image then you have basically your program your docker image running and in that at that point that become a, a live docker container so just wanted to make the, the quick distinction between the two uh, later we will be providing the these slides so you can also follow the link what is a, a container if you are new to this uh, to this technology. Next slide. So I will soon take over the, the sharing and I will share my screen with you uh, and I will guide you on the, on the challenge website. But just to show you the different steps um, which are required to make a submission. So the first step for you will be to register on Synapse, which uh, hopefully you have already done. So both creating an account on Synapse and then registering for the challenge. So then you will create your own private Synapse project. And I will show you a few uh, features and services that comes with uh, a Synapse project. And then you will start maybe downloading the data that we make available. Then you will start developing a model on your local environment. You will create a Docker file. You will, using this Docker file, you, you will build and create a Docker image. And then you will be able to upload this Docker image to, to your private Synapse project on Synapse. And when you think that it's a, a version that you are ready to submit to the challenge, 
uh, as you can see in the image. Um, and I will basically go um, show you live now how, how to do that. So sharing my screen. Okay. So now you should be able to see my screen. James, can you? Okay. So here I'm on Synapse. Just minimizing that. So this is a website of the um, of the metadata automation dream challenge. On the home page, you have access to uh, a brief description of the of the scientific question. So quick introduction. Here you have the timeline of the of the challenge, and um, once we have um, edited the, the recording, uh, then we will and uploaded the recording online. Then we will put a link to both the slides and the video on the on the home page of the challenge. So you will be able to to go over the recording. Um, okay. So what I wanted to show you is. So on Synapse, you have the option to create your own project. So here, for instance, I've created a project called uh, tshafter-test. And if you want, the challenge website is a project in itself. So if you want, you can also create a wiki, which looks like, like this one with a table of content and, and different pages. Most importantly, you have this file section where you can upload any file you want, and you can very fine with fine grain, you can set the, set the permission of this file, whether you want this file to be public or accessible only to a few people. Um, your own private project also come with a discussion forum. Um, not sure it's going to be used uh, extensively, but you, you can use it. And uh, later, if you decide to make your Synapse project public, then that could be also a place for um, other scientists to come and ask you questions. And um, most importantly, you have also this, sec this section called uh, Docker, and that's where you can list all, all your uh, Docker images. And here, so when you click on it, you have really the list of all the Docker images that you have uploaded to your private project. So here, for instance, I'm selecting one. And here you have additional information. So if you have tagged your Docker image with multiple for instance, you use like a version one, version two, all these different versions would be listed here. So once you are on this page, if you want to submit it to the challenge, um, you would come here. So to the Docker re uh, repository tools, submit Docker repository to challenges. And then it's asking you which version of your Docker image you want to submit. So either the, the latest one, which is like the, the default tag added to the latest version, or if you have other manually versioned, um, you can also select them. So here I'm just going to select the latest one. And then it's going to show you a list of all the challenges you have participated to. So I'm registered to a few challenges, so that way I have a lot of options. But basically, then you would select one. And then it would ask you whether you are submitting this Docker image as an individual or as part of a team. So it's really important that um, if you decide to work as a team, that you first create a team, and then later you will make, and then you will make this submission uh, as part of the team. But if you make a submission as an individual, you will not be able to, to participate, to make submission as part of a team later. In a, in a round, we, we allow actually team to, to shuffle, to, re, to, to, choose, to change their composition, between between rounds and then you would click on submit and then the, your submission would be sent to the challenge so right now we don't have the infrastructure fully ready so that's why in the list of all the challenges uh, the metadata uh, automation dream challenge doesn't appear but before the start of the round one we will send you uh, we will give you access to the name of, of the submission queue but that's basically how you submit a docker image uh, hosted on a private Synapse project, private Synapse project to the challenge, uh, to the challenge queue. And then if you go on the official website, there will be a page that only you uh, will be able to, to see. So that's not this leaderboard. Leaderboard will, is really where we will be publishing the results. 
but there will be another page called most likely dashboards and there you will be you will be able to see a table that only you can see and this table will show you all your submission and uh, it will also show you the, the status of your submission whether your submission is waiting in the in the submission queue if it's running or if it has failed and if it has successfully completed then we may also return you the, the score uh, which you will see there and synapse is also sending email notification so as soon as your submission fail you should also receive a, an email and if for some reason you think that you should have received a notification or if you receive an error, um, please use the discussion forum to contact us and then we can further also help you to investigate what, uh, what went wrong. Um, so you have this section on the uh, website called how to participate. So I invite you to have a look at the Docker submission page, which lists really all the steps I briefly mentioned before like creating a synapse, your own Synapse project, then start building your model. And you can follow this, this, this set of instructions. And ultimately, you should be able, by the end, to submit the baseline model that James uh, has developed. And then you can further develop from there, or if you want, you can start from, from scratch. Um, so I think that's it. I, Maybe we can go now to the to the question. So we still have 13, 13 minutes. So I'm going maybe to share the screen with James. Do we have some question we, we want to address? <coughs> Here, um, okay. I can let me unmute you. Oh. All right. Um, so stepping through some of the open questions still. Um, and if we need any follow up on some of the answered questions, we can get to those as well. Um, so I, I'm the one who developed the um, baseline tool. Um, it's hard to give a, you know, a concrete estimate of how much time it took. Um, it was something that I took on after having spent a decent amount of time looking at the challenge uh, data and um, kind of the different uh, nuances within it. So I had a good starting point in terms of how I wanted to approach it. Um, a lot of the, the iteration, um, at least for me, was kind of going from uh, fairly non-performant uh, brute force approaches to little tweaks that I could make to kind of streamline things and have it sensible to, to run in um, a decent amount of time. I think all in all, between um, you know, initial attempts and tweaking, I probably spent a few days on it. Um, but then I, I've kind of gone back and, and made some additional modifications uh, over the last few weeks. So um, I think it, it could be something that uh, becomes uh, more intuitive to different people, depending on uh, their background and their approach. Um, it's also worth noting that the baseline tool doesn't really do any sort of uh, machine learning. It's, it's more of a, a, a logical step through of um, trying to do the matching based on the conditions that we're aware of. Um, okay, so next question, and then we can follow up on that if there's more. Um, will we be able to test Docker submission before the leaderboard phase? So um, technically, no. Uh, we won't have the submission queue open until the leaderboard phase, um, but we will provide um, scripts that we're that we'll use in the scoring environment, both for validation and for scoring. So you can locally test whether your um, Docker container can uh, produce outputs that are, are valid and uh, able to be scored. Um, the baseline code is in R, uh, mostly because that's uh, my preferred language for data munging and working with uh, text. Um, but it could have probably easily been developed in, in Python or a similar language. There's nothing uh, too special about the R code. Um, okay, and then a question from Justin Reese. Consider a non-enumerated value or non-enumerated column with the value 10.12345 for a CDE that um, oh just disappeared. Oh, Denise may have answered. Oh, Denise may have answered. Okay. All right. Well, I'll come back to that one if I need to. You can click on the answer tab. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. So Denise answered that she would consider it conforming. And we can maybe follow up with that in the discussion thread because I know that's a slightly complex one. Um, all right, what else have I? Um, when will the non-synthetic data be made available? That should hopefully be ready by uh, the end of this week or early next week. We are uh, just doing some additional QC and checks on um, how the, the splitting is working, um, but it, it should be pretty close to done. Um, 